Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Five Steps to Network Observability Nirvana. Before we dive into today's presentation, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have a question at any point during the event, please submit via the chat window. We will address your questions throughout the conversation and at the end of the presentation. Also, the recorded version of today's presentation will be available throughout following the event. Please look for an email from the Kentic team to rewatch and share the presentation. And now, Christoph, I will turn it over to you. Cool. Thanks, Angela. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we'll talk a little bit about network observability and the five steps you can take to get to, uh, to, get to a good place. And um, you know, once the marketing teams put their spin on it, it became Nirvana, which today I can't promise. But what I can tell you is that you might learn a thing or two. So here's the lineup for uh, today. My name is Christoph Fister, and I'm the Chief Product Officer here at uh, Kentic. And with me here are Anil, Anil Murdy, who's our Director of Product Management, and then Dan Rohan, who is a Senior PM on the Kentic uh, team. And while we look young, um, together we have a few decades of experience <laughs> around networks, and we all share a passion for what makes the internet and the digital economy go. So. Networks are a big part of that, obviously. And so today we want to make uh, the case that uh, networks are more complex, more diverse, uh, more closely tied to the apps and services that run over them, and therefore more critical than uh, ever, and therefore need a new approach to managing them. And we call it approach network observability. And we'll explain exactly what we mean. We'll show you some cool demos. And we'll also give you some hints on the steps you can take uh, to take the journey towards uh, it, no matter where you are today as a network ops team or an organization broadly. But before we go into the content, we want to learn a little bit more about you. And so once the poll comes up, if you would please answer um, these questions or pick the one that uh, most closely resembles your current status. And we'll give you guys a few minutes, well, a few seconds to fill it in. I think we're gonna, yeah, I think we're here. So let me go ahead and end the poll and I will go ahead and share the results. Cool, and the winner is we're, we use multiple solutions for network monitoring, but they're not well integrated. Well, you guys have come to a good place because that's exactly what we're going to uh, talk about uh, today. So I'll close the poll here on my screen. And with that, let's dive right in. So probably not a big surprise to anybody in this call, but um, networks are increasingly complex and that's with a big C. Uh, and why is that? Well, because most networks teams now have to deal with cloud and hybrid networks. And as your organizations deploy technologies like cloud, containers, Kubernetes, service mesh, and so on, well, your infrastructure in general and your networks become more uh, complex. And that's because there are many more components, obviously, but also there are more places. You don't necessarily have management control over them. And then also these components are much more dynamic, meaning some run only for a very short period of time and then you know how do you how do you catch that but also uh, the second important point networks today are uh, much more closely tied to the apps or the services that your companies provide and that's because most new apps today are uh, SaaS uh, as a service right and by definition that means they're delivered over the internet uh, which some have called the new enterprise backbone network but unlike you know, the old backbones and the old uh, on-prem infrastructures we used to have, well, the reality is the uh, internet is an interconnected web of, I think last count, more than 60,000 uh, autonomous systems. And delivery is mostly best effort. So long story short, uh, today's networks more complex, more critical, and therefore expected to be really flawless. And that's why Gartner, as an example, says by 2024, which is not that far uh, away, 50% uh, of network operations teams uh, are expected um, to uh, re-architect the network monitoring stack. And um, you know, we agree with that assertion, but 
how do you do that? You know, what do you architect uh, for? And so we believe that in order to deal with these challenges, um, you need a new approach, or we need a new approach as an industry. And the interesting thing is that the approach is already uh, used in other layers of the stack. For example, today you'll be hard pressed to find a DevOps team that doesn't have an observability uh, solution deployed. And we believe now is the time to bring these concepts um, around observability uh, to the network and apply some of these principles that were tried and tested in other parts of the stack like compute and uh, the applications. But then you may ask, well, what exactly is network observability? Is it just a fancy new verb for monitoring as some have suggested? Is it just a different spin on the logs, metrics, traces definition from the DevOps world? And we say absolutely not. Uh, it's much broader, and it's and it's at its core, uh, observability requires interactivity, and you can also call that open-ended exploration. Well, what does that mean? It means collecting all the data, all the telemetry about the network, putting it into a big data lake, <laughs> big like that. And then on top of that, uh, a user interface allowing you to ask uh, any sort of question about that data and about the network. And you know, the questions are, some of the questions are here on the slide. Um, is the network the problem? And that one is often framed as, oh, it must be the network because if the app, app is slow, my code is perfect, so it must be the network. A little uh, tongue in cheek, of course. Or are we under a DDoS attack is one of uh, questions we hear a lot from our customers. Uh, or would cost be less if we change the path of the traffic or our traffic egresses, which is one that uh, we hear quite a bit um, over the last you know, few weeks and months, uh, just recently from somebody who actually uh, egressed all of their out-of-region traffic in uh, EMEA through a router in Brazil. And you know that was probably uh, pretty costly. And so the key here really is um, any question, because today, the reality is um, what we call these unknown problems. And what we mean by that is, you know, the things you couldn't see coming or instrument for, uh, you will see those every day in your complex networks and infrastructures. And so the canned answers of the past that kind of had, you know, the dashboards and instrumentation of a few devices and a few uh, thresholds, they're not going to be able to do the job uh, anymore. And looking at one uh, more question on this list. Um, it's because it's my transition to the next slide. Uh, one that's also being asked um, more and more is what is our, what is our cloud latency? Um, and why is that? Well, because tons of applications are not very tolerant, tolerant of latency uh, in general. Uh, you know, even AWS acknowledged that um, in the recent past, and now they have more and more edge services like uh, you know AWS Outposts, Wavelengths, and local zones. And so, so latency is super important. And uh, let me give you a specific example uh, where latency can literally make or break things. So we're in 2020, almost 2021. Uh, robots are real, and online supermarkets are uh, real, and so. There are these robots zooming around a warehouse to pack groceries in uh, bins, and they can put together a, an order of 50 or so groceries in less than five minutes, which then gets put, in, uh, put into bags. And so in this warehouse that you see in the picture, there are about 1,000 robots, and they work uh, 70,000 orders uh, a week. And as you can imagine, these things move fast. And they cross paths, and you know they zip uh, by each other, and of course, any latency or uh, packet loss in this system can create a big, huge mess. And so there is this critical need to observe the infrastructure, the bandwidth towards these warehouses, and of course, the overall performance of the network. And for this kind of stuff, you can't use your grandfather's network management solution because it doesn't handle the internet or anything outside the data center uh, very well. And uh, I think this is a pretty cool use case. And while I can't tell you the name of the customer, it's a real example of network observability in action. So now that we've established what uh, network observability 
uh, what the need is for network observability, let's uh, talk a little bit about what it requires. And so to observe, first thing you have to do is to have, you have to see, you have to see broadly, meaning it's not enough to just see your on-prem network. Um, it's not enough to just see, you know, your traditional data center, you need visibility into the cloud networking infrastructure. Um, especially if your company is like many and has gone beyond like the just one VPC setup in AWS, as an example. Uh, you need visibility into the internet itself, uh, the ASNs that carry your traffic, and so on. The second thing you need is broad telemetry support. So SNMP won't do the job alone. Traffic and flow won't do the job alone. Streaming telemetry won't do the job alone. And the same is true for synthetics uh, telemetry. You really need all of these. And by the way, to capture this telemetry, sometimes you may need agents, but they should be optional. And when they're needed, they should be available, uh, but be lightweight and open uh, first and foremost. And then the final uh, box on this slide is about uh, context or uh, what we also call enrichment. So what's the geolocation of the network element? What's the metadata I've captured from my cloud environments? Uh, what's the thread feeds I insert into my uh, traffic flows to know whether the traffic is potentially malicious? So context is huge. It's important. And some, you know, I've actually called context being the new uh, correlation. So it's a real, you know, fundamental uh, thing. Um, and so the result of combining all of uh, the networks, all of the telemetry, all of this context is a rich uh, data set that enables, enables asking all these questions that uh, we mentioned before, and then making timely informed decisions about your uh, network, basically driving outcomes. So how do you do that? Well, uh, there's a few different aspects to driving. So first of all, you know, we now have this overwhelming data set from uh, the left-hand side of the slide. How do you make sense of all of, the, of this data? And the answer is, proactive insights. And what's behind those is uh, some you know, pretty rich statistical analysis, increasingly machine learning, although it's you know, big hype in the industry, but you know, true machine learning is still relatively uh, rare. But you know, what these things uh, should be able to tell you is, hey, there's a traffic spike on interface X, and here's what, like, what's likely causing it. Or Hey, your traffic has shifted from peering to transit, and you know the cost uh, may have increased. So you do want, you want to do something about that. Um, so that's sort of the first uh, level, the canned insights in uh, in quotes. But then you know going back to asking any questions, the yeah, the ability to um, you know ask in more or less real time what's going on in the network based on full granularity of the data, not any rollups. That's the open-ended exploration I've talked about uh, before. The ability to quickly dive into these unknown problems, the things you couldn't uh, see coming or instrument for is really, really key. And of course, you need um, an API. And then finally, you have to be able to act on these insights, right? And that can be as simple as creating a ticket in your favorite uh, problem management solution, or it can be things like uh, you know, kicking in a workflow to actively resolve uh, a problem. And finally, finally, all this capability has to be delivered in a form factor that is uh, real time, that scales to any size network, doesn't have any appliances, by the way, um, doesn't need the, the customer yourselves to install, maintain, and upgrade software all the time. In other words, it should be a managed service. So how does this look like in a bit uh, more detail? And let's look at the Kentic Network Observability Cloud. So first, there is the platform uh, where all the enrichment, the storage, again, we're talking huge data sets here, uh, the analytics and the API access takes place. And so the idea really is to get on the API to let you guys, the customer, uh, do everything you can do in the UI also via API you know, huge portion of good observability practices um, because that enables you to integrate uh, the solution into your existing tool chains. So nobody should, you know, assume that they just come in and, you know, 
it's all uh, Kentig or it's all whatever uh, your favorite tool, right? So integration is key and that happens through APIs. Um, of course, then the platform ingests and correlates and adds context uh, on these, you know, telemetry sources uh, that we've talked about a little bit before. So, you know, flows, including the flow, cloud flows, uh, streaming telemetry, uh, host metrics, uh, SNMP, synthetics are all uh, sources. But then, very importantly, we believe that customers don't buy a platform. Uh, they buy products that solve problems. And that's why we've increasingly uh, allowing uh, to consume Kentic both as a suite, but then also as distinct uh, products, meaning we don't require you to consume everything at once. And then the products, you know, obviously solve problems uh, and facilitate different use cases. For example, our core product allows for troubleshooting, capacity planning uh, of data center, van, SD1, van type environments, and a few more. Uh, we've been selective here. You add synthetics to that, and all of a sudden, you can manage the digital experience, uh, the SaaS performance of applications. And by the way, as we'll see in a minute, you can correlate synthetics and uh, traffic uh, telemetry to provide much, much more uh, meaningful insights uh, about your environment. And then as a third example, you may add the cloud module and look into your on-prem to AWS or on-prem to Google or on-prem to Azure uh, traffic. And not just the traffic, but also the performance and the cost. And of course, these products that you see in the second line, they uh, seamlessly integrate because they're built on the same foundation and platform. And my final comment here is that, um, of course, Kentic supports many more use cases than what you see on this uh, slide. We just haven't been able to fit them all <laughs> to make the slide still uh, legible. Uh, for example, uh, in the protect module, uh, DDoS detection and mitigation is a very important uh, use case for us. And you know we have it. Uh, now our edge module that you see towards the left allows for traffic engineering, backbone peering analytics, and uh, so on. So hopefully this gives you a taste of what network observability, observability is, but uh, now we'll stop with the slide where for a little bit and want to show you for real what this can do for your business or team. And for that, we have prepared uh, two demos. So the first demo will be delivered by Anil, and we'll show you how autonomous and continuous testing can be a big advantage in today's network environments. And then the second demo delivered by Dan will show you how to troubleshoot an AWS outage and take some quick action. And this is probably a timely demo, because most of you have heard that AWS had an outage just before Thanksgiving, and that had pretty widespread implications. For example, my Roomba wasn't uh, working anymore. Um, all right, with that, Anil, over uh, to you. Thank you, Christoph. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can start demoing. So you should see my screen now? Yep. Cool, thank you. All right, so, um, to start with, I'm just showing you a general view of our platform here. Um, and so like as Christoph mentioned, our platform accepts telemetry data from a variety of sources. And so you can see here, we have data coming in from both cloud as well as on-prem and hybrid environments. Uh, and we also have synthetic data right there in, in the context of everything else. Um, so I won't spend a ton of time talking about our general platform uh, because the focus today is synthetics. So I'm gonna go into the menu here and go into the first item under synthetics uh, and talk about our synthetic product. So what you're looking at now is what we refer to as our performance dashboard. Um, and so once you have synthetics tests configured in the system, this is where you would come in and see any tests that are sort of alerting and uh, you know are failing in any ways, and you can sort of drill into them from here. The other thing that you see on the screen uh, goes to Christoph's point about wanting to know latency between various cloud regions or between on-prem infrastructure and cloud, uh, which is becoming more and more important in today's applications. Uh, so what you see here are sample network uh, performance meshes. Uh, the idea here is you should be able to pick any number of sites and be able to test uh, connectivity between those sites on an ongoing basis. So in this case, we have uh, three meshes. Each of these meshes is testing connectivity between various um, 
uh, availability zones of the three main cloud providers. Uh, and so what I can do from here is number one, I can look at these meshes and quickly know if you know certain points or certain paths between the various um, availability zones are exceeding certain thresholds. So you can see in this case, GCP seems all green, but there's a certain, certain points that are red and orange in case of Azure and AWS. I can hover over these and I can see the three main metrics that um, any network operator or network engineer would care about, which is latency, packet loss, and jitter. Um, not only can I see it in one direction, I can see it in the reverse direction as well. Um, so in this case, you can see going from uh, you know one location to another and back, um, the jitter is good one way, but not so good the other way. Uh, and so this is the idea with us, uh, with our um, sort of network performance mesh tests. Setting up these tests is super easy. And to show you how that happens, I'm just going to go into Test Control Center here, uh, which is where you can configure tests from. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit quickly about um, how you can set up a mesh test like that and then jump into what I really want to talk about, which is the autonomous test. So Configuring one of these mesh tests is super easy. Um, you don't have to set up individual tests one by one. You just go ahead and pick um, the sites which are represented by agents, which can be agents that you install as well as agents that are available out of the box. So pick any number of these agents, hit save, and uh, you know the test basically gets configured where you're testing from each site to every other site and it gets configured all automatically without you having to set up individual tests. Um, you have the option of testing uh, every minute by default, but you can go down all the way to every second. Um, so you'll recall from Christoph's presentation, uh, him talking about applications where uh, the latency and, and jitter requirements are so extreme where you know the slightest amount of change in, in the amount of latency results in um, a more in, in a more uh, higher requirements for margins in, in robotic applications. And so being able to test every second is really important in that situation. And Kentic is the only platform uh, that offers you the ability to test pretty much continuously on a per second basis. Um, so that's the site mesh test. Now going back here, um, you'll see that uh, in our sensory testing platform today, we offer testing both at the network layer. So you can test, test um, you know, to an IP address, to a host name, between two agents or to any SaaS applications. You can also test performance of HTTP servers and DNS servers. So this is the, the standard type of test that you expect to do um, with most synthetic type of applications. The one type of test that you won't find anywhere else is uh, what we refer to as the autonomous tests. So the idea with autonomous tests is rather than you having to have a specific destination uh, in mind, like an IP address or a host name, uh, all you need is an intent to test towards a specific type of entity. This entity may be a ASN, which is a, 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 any, any network out there, um, um, or a CDN, a country, a region, or a city. And then once you have that intent to want to test performance towards that entity, um, what we can do, because we have access to not just synthetic test data, but also flow information, is uh, we can look at the traffic that is uh, going out and coming into your sites uh, based on the, based on us looking at flow data, and we can then say, hey, these are all the all the various ASNs that have traffic going, uh, you know, outbound or inbound from your sites, and then sort them sort of by the amount of traffic, and uh, we'll show you like which of these sites are currently being monitored and which ones are not being monitored. Now, if you decide to choose to monitor one of these sites, which would make sense because you have traffic going towards them, and you pick one of these ASNs, what we'll do then is we'll run another query and say, you know, these are all the sites that have traffic going towards that ASN, and these would be your sites um, uh, areas. It could be data centers, it could be networks that you have. Um, and in cases where you have agents uh, set up in any of your own data centers, we will show you those agents. So these are synthetic agents that you would install. And, uh, and in cases where there are agents, you can go ahead and add those agents to this test here. And um, you know, once you add these agents, what we will do then is run a query to pull out specific uh, IP endpoints or IP destinations from this ASN and create this automatically for you. Um, so that's the idea with the autonomous test. So these, uh, in these cases, you don't have to specify any sort of specific IP addresses. Uh, we'll find them for you and create the test automatically. The other thing we'll do is we will repeat that same query every so often. So by default, we'll run that same query to find new IP addresses every 12 hours, but you can choose to do that every hour or as infrequently as every week. 
and we'll find new IP addresses and add them to the list of um, tests that we, that we execute for you. Um, so that's the idea with autonomous tests. The idea here is with leveraging flow data to uh, reduce the burden of having to set up and maintain and refresh these tests uh, on an ongoing basis. So to show you how these um, tests get presented in terms of results, I'll go back to the test control center here and I'll filter down to the ASN tests on the right here. So these are all the ASN tests that are configured in the system. Uh, I'm going to pick this one that says Equinix. So this one's testing towards the Equinix um, ASN. And I'm going to first edit this test to show you um, how it was set up. So in this case, we said we want to test performance towards um, the Equinix network. And we're going to pick a combination of private agents as well as cloud agents or public agents here. And uh, we're going to want to repeat this query every 12 hours. And we're testing every minute, but we have the option of going down to every second here as well. Uh, so to look at the results now, um, what you'll see here is that for each of the agents that uh, were picked as part of this test, um, you'll see a set of tests set up. And keep in mind that none of these IP addresses were specified as part of setting up the test. They're all created automatically. Uh, and then in terms of the results, you um, see you know, latency generated packet loss with the, the three main metrics that you care about um, in, in terms of metrics here. You can quickly get to points where it's exceeding a certain threshold and it's marked as orange. The other key pieces of information that you see here are um, you're able to pull out information about the providers and the connectivity types that are being uh, sort of transited along the way. And then if you have traffic going across these uh, paths, which you should, because you know that's what that's what these tests are about, then you would see uh, that real traffic in the same context. So if you had a situation where um, you were experiencing or, or noticing an issue with the synthetic test, you can look at, you know, in that same context, what is the uh, potential impacted traffic out here? Uh, what you can do from here is you can go into the details of this and we'll show you not just the uh, the three synthetic metrics graphed over time, but also the um, actual real traffic in that same context. So if you if you notice a, a spike like this, you can look at, you know, this is the amount of real traffic that's getting impacted here. Um, so going back here now, uh, the other thing that we show you in the same context is an overall view of the entire flow traffic as it's flowing um, from each of these data centers towards each of these destinations and the uh, various providers that it's passing through along the way. Uh, and then from here, if you were to find issues, uh, not only will you know which specific path is failing, um, you can get down into the details of specifically what paths are in trouble. So in this view here, we're showing you the paths taken by the packets as the synthetic testing uh, packets as they're going from each of these agents towards each of the destinations. And uh, you know, you can click on a given node here and it will show you more information about uh, specifically what's what's going on there. So if this happens to be a, a node that's in your network and we're getting SNMP data from it, we'll be able to pull in not just the IP address and the location, but also uh, egress and ingress information, and interface information for you. Um, so that's the that's sort of one of the ways that we um, are, you know, leveraging flow as well as synthetic and active monitoring data to bring more context to the testing that you would do and you know, sort of reduce the amount of time it takes you to get to the source of the problem. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the main things I wanted to show off today. There's a lot more I can talk about, but I want to make sure I reserve time for Dan. So with that, I'll hand things over to Dan. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Anil. Go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to show you folks how you can leverage network observability techniques to troubleshoot a cloud outage with Kentic. Um, and as Christoph mentioned earlier, AWS had a pretty major outage. It took out a huge portion of the internet right before Thanksgiving, highly inconvenient timing. Um, and this left a lot of people scrambling to kind of understand how this impacted them and figure out what they needed to do to restore operations. And so I'm going to use this time to show you how you can, how our demo customer, uh, Acme Inc., um, used our products to get a handle on this outage and, and move their organizations towards uh, a mitigation. So just as a bit of setup here, um, Acme operates a hybrid infrastructure in multiple clouds, a couple of data centers, branch offices throughout the world. And just like many of you who are impacted by this event, uh, Acme's SRE and DevOps teams reached out to the NetOps teams to help them understand what the impact was on, on their operations. And this is a really common pattern because the tools that DevOps teams use to monitor their world 
are usually based around the logs, the metrics, and the traces that Christoph mentioned earlier. Um, and they very rarely have tools that can look at the whole big picture of their infrastructure like we're going to do here today. So coming into the Kentic map, you know, we can see the entire Acme infrastructure at a glance. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we've got the clouds that they operate in. So we've got Amazon, Azure, Google, IBM. And then below that, we've got their on-prem network represented in a cord diagram where we can see all of their data centers and their offices. Um, and we can even drill into any of these things and, and start to see some of the health because we also monitor the SNMP data of all the devices in these facilities. So uh, it's a really quick way of getting some, some health infrastructure information. And then the other thing the map provides here is a view into the internet because every good hybrid network is built on the internet as we discussed earlier. And so that shows off uh, the traffic to and from your source and destination networks, as well as the providers and the next tops. Uh, and tying all this together, we've got the, the traffic between these different things. So you can have an at a glance uh, visualization of, of how your traffic is flowing between these different components. Um, all right, so we can also click on anything here. So I'm gonna click on AWS just to show you. Here's the, an example of, of our current traffic um, through the AWS infrastructure, but for the uh, purposes of the demo, I'm gonna come over here and go back in time. So I'm gonna click to and from, and then we'll go back to Thanksgiving. So I believe we want to go to the 25th and say 11 a.m. And we want to go back to, we'll go straight through to the 26th at 2 a.m. if I recall. And we just hit apply. All right. Oh, did I not hit apply? Oops. All right, just do a quick refresh. I always love that. All right, so we'll do that once more. Two a.m. All right, two a.m. Do a slightly wider window. All right, so now we can see the dip in traffic that uh, uh, represents the impact that this outage had on Acme's environments. And using the map, we can see everything, and that's great. Um, the map helps here a lot with that, but that's often just the beginning. Um, Kentlet's Data Explorer was, was really built to enable network observability. And so what that means to us is that, as Chris mentioned, it, it allows you to ask any question. And so in this kind of case, we have a lot of questions that we want to ask. And, and so let's drive, dive into the Data Explorer to uh, check that out and how we can do that. So clicking View in Data Explorer brings up the same chart that we left off with in the map. Um, but we've got this, this nice set of tools over here that allow us to really dig deep here. Um, and so to illustrate this, let's see what Acme did to kind of uh, understand the impact of this outage. And so the first thing that we need to understand is, is what kind of traffic was impacted. Was it internal or external or multi-cloud traffic? And we can do this really easily by adding our traffic profile dimension. Okay, so looking here at this graph, we can start to see the, the story unfold. And prior to the incident, you know, we see the vast majority of our AWS traffic was internal. Um, and then closely following that, we also see this profile called, you know, from cloud to outside, meaning traffic that originated in the cloud, but went out to the internet, but not including my on-prem network. Um, and as the incident unfolds, we can start to see, you know, this moderate decrease in traffic from, from 12 to 1400 hours, maybe sharp, really. Where, where traffic was just a fraction of, of what it was previously. Um, you know, and we can see here that some traffic profiles actually remained untouched, but we can dig into this a little more, uh, a little better visually if we change our visualization and, and uh, adjust some of the controls here. So I'm gonna zoom in on that dip a bit, and then I'm gonna come up here to our query pane and change this to a line chart. And I'll just go ahead and turn off the historical uh, layer, which is that gray dashed line to get that out of the way. We can also get rid of the total overlay. And now we can start to see the traffic profiles that really took a dive during this outage. 
Um, so what were they? We can see, uh, we can use a neat feature of Data Explorer to really dig in here. Um, so I'll, I'll do that in a moment, but I'll just point out that uh, the ones that seemed most impacted was our cloud internal. So let's go over here to the query and adjust our dimensions. Let's take a look at the regions in the cloud that were impacted at this time. So we rerun that and we see that Acme is running out of two regions here, US East 1 and US East 2. So I'm going to come back here and I want to know essentially what are the what's the traffic profile of each one of these regions. So I'm going to come down here to the generate one chart per series, which essentially acts as a, 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 a way of examining each one of the um, dimensions that we've selected here. And then provide an additional layer of, of uh, detail sort of building an on-demand dashboard. So I'm gonna go back to traffic profile. Hit save, the query automatically reruns. And let's just take a look at these resulting dashboards. So first we have our US East one dashboard. Uh, and we can see that, you know, uh, what we saw earlier, most of this traffic was internal workloads with a small amount of customer traffic, you know, outbound represented by the cloud to outside profile. Um, and then below this, we've got our AWS uh, traffic that isn't associated with a specific region. And, and so you can think of these are services that are globally available, like S3 or IAM or CloudFront, server certificates, et cetera. Um, really interesting here because you can see that, and, and if you followed some of the news, you know that uh, these services uh, were impacted despite the fact that they're advertised as global services. And then we only find out later after the fact that many of these global services actually did run in US East 1. And then we see our, our hot spare, which is US East 2. And we can see that all of the, the services that are running um, had uh, you know, virtually or absolutely no impact whatsoever. And so this starts to tell a CRISPR story. We now know which regions affected and which regions have been stable, but let's dig further here. And um, you know, in the interest of time, I'll just say, let's, let's figure out what we need to tell our SREs um, and our DevOps folks about how they can get back on track quickly. So I'm gonna click here on US East 2, which refocuses our queries just on the healthy environment. And let's come back up here to start asking our data more questions. We can see here that we're focused on US East 2. Let's change our dimensions again to really dig into our cloud dimensions and say, let's take a look at our VPCs so we can find out what our healthy VPCs are and then our availability zones. We can reorder anything. Let's say source zone, source VPC, save that and run that. And now we're left with really valuable information. We can get on the phone, we can say, okay, folks, let's, uh, let's redeploy our apps into US East 2B. Uh, we've got a good VPC ready to go, E7A, let's get to it. Um, and so with that, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Christoph, um, to uh, take it away. Cool. Let me share my screen. You guys see it? Yep. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Amazing demos. Um, hopefully, this has given you a bit of a glimpse of the tangible value that uh, a network observability platform, in this case, Kentic, can uh, deliver. But what we wanted to do is to drive the point home and give you some real hard data from our existing customers. And so back in July, not that long ago, we surveyed a big number of them, um, about 120 to be exact. So, you know, pretty decent N. And here is what they told us about uh, the value they get. So in terms of uptime, you know, key here for our digital uh, experience and digital economy, 54% uh, of our customers get uh, uptime improved by 25% or more. Uh, productivity, you know, we all know our teams, NetOps teams are constantly under, you know, fire, fire drills. And so getting productivity up uh, is a real important metric uh, to look at. And so 64% of our customers get, um, mean time to uh, repair and mean time to innocence. That's kind of a new one. Um, 
improved by 25% or more. And then finally, cost, always a topic, especially if you have to sell you know, this to your uh, management chain of command. Uh, one fifth of our customers see OPEX, uh, operating cost uh, savings, as a top uh, benefit. So real tangible uh, benefit on top of the coolness that you've seen from uh, Anil and uh, Dan in the demos. But I'm going to bring this to life just a little bit more uh, and uh, show you some logos. Uh, and so all of these companies use Cantic for network observability across their organizations. And of course, the key use cases are network troubleshooting, as we've seen, uh, capacity planning, optimization, transit analytics, uh, and so on. And I'll let you read uh, these comments uh, by yourself. Um, you know, really good UI, uh, purpose built for effective network operations, and so on. You know, we're very proud to be able to partner with all of these companies, including Zoom. Uh, which we're on right now, and uh, <laughs> who has become the the go-to for a uh, great many of us as we work from home. And you know they're doing an amazing job delivering a great experience, and uh, Kentic helps uh, with that uh, as well. So, in the beginning, we said this webinar is about uh, the five steps to uh, Nirvana, and now let's talk a little bit about those uh, five steps. To reach this place that you know many of the digital uh, native companies that I've shown on the prior slide really have come pretty uh, close to like what you know what do we what do we as enterprises have to do to uh, all also get to uh, towards that state and so as you can see uh, this is a um, uh, you know five step uh, process essentially uh, the closer you get to the right the more the value goes up. And of course, all this is uh, illustrative, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to make the point. So uh, the first step is what we call binary monitoring. Um, and most of you are probably already doing this. So to give you an anecdote, way back when I started in this business, and I'm going to date myself here a little bit, but you know, it was in the glory days of uh, the granddaddy of network management software, HP OpenView. And, uh, you know, Post me something in the chat if uh, you remember that name. You know, that was this type of stuff was the gold uh, standard interface up, interface down, and showing that on a nice map. I mean, that was, you know, the ultimate, right? But today, probably not good enough. So, uh, you know, people essentially started to add uh, telemetry. Uh, some SNMP metrics and counters, and you know, still all super device centric. Uh, the big picture is mostly missing in um, this phase of the process. And of course, you're not looking uh, anywhere beyond your on prem uh, networks toward cloud or uh, the internet. Uh, so we call it partial, you know, call it what you'd like, but it's pretty limited. Um, the third step here is probably where most of the industry is today. So yes, there's monitoring of devices, uh, there's instrumentation of network elements, there's some flow traffic monitoring, maybe even some synthetics, uh, but it's all pretty scattered. And so as an example, there's no way to use traffic to direct your synthetics as we've seen in Anil's uh, demo, or uh, zero correlation of telemetry sources into uh, higher level uh, insights as uh, Dan has shown uh, some. And so this is you know, a decent place to be, but it's probably not good enough for uh, the digital uh, transformation that we're all in. And so step four is where you bring some of these things together in a pretty comprehensive uh, way. And there's not too many examples of tooling out there that would allow you to do that on the network um, layer, of course, I'm talking. Uh, you know, there's a product that's made in my home country. I won't uh, you know, mention the name that has some aspects of this, but you know, even the tools that are out there completely lack in what defines observability, as we've discussed before, this, you know, ability to explore beyond the simple dashboards. And, you know, Dan has just uh, hopefully shown you that in a very uh, graphical way. It's like, you know, one thing is a static dashboard, but then what do you do with that? You know, when something happens, well, you have to explore, you have to drill down. And that's exactly what uh, network observability is all about. And that's, you know, where you want to want to get. You want to get towards step five, which is correlated enriched telemetry in a single view. 
And then, you know, the ability to answer uh, any question on top of that, whether it's guided through insights, which we haven't touched on today in the demo anyway, or unbounded as uh, Dan has shown with the data explorer. Uh, and of course, you know, all of this should be delivered in the SaaS form factor, uh, managed as um, a service, so your company doesn't have to worry about installing, upgrading, maintaining uh, the system. Uh, and so then the only decision you have to make uh, if you aspire towards this um, you know, level of observability is whether you want to build it or buy it, because it can be built. Uh, you know, there's open source tooling out there, and Kentic, by the way, uh, is and will be a major contributor to allow people to build some of this as we roll out uh, open source components like some agent tree and stuff like that. But of course, if you build it, you'll have to maintain it. And back to the previous point, you know, if that is you, we want to help you by providing you with some of the essential building blocks. Uh, and, you know, that's totally fine for us if you show some of this uh, data in Grafana dashboards as an example. Uh, but, you know, you have to do uh, some pretty heavy lifting. Um, so, in the interest of time and maybe opening up for some questions, we've covered uh, quite some ground, but here's the net net. And back in the day, we used to call this a conclusion, but uh, nowadays it's the TLDR, and it does sound much cooler, I admit, I admit that. Uh, <laughs> so, number one, um, very key in my mind, network professionals like yourselves, you need observability principles, tools, and platforms. Um, you know, just practicing observability at the compute and application layers is not enough, not, not enough any longer. And, um, you know, that's because these networks, as we've seen, need to work uh, flawlessly. I think there's a strong case to be made that observability leads to better performance, reliability, security, uh, remediation, and eventually, you know, growth for uh, your company. You know, we believe strongly that legacy tools are not good enough for the modern infrastructure uh, stack uh, because, you know, that's what our survey uh, showed, because they don't see the internet and the clouds and they don't allow you to ask the right uh, questions of the network and do it uh, instantly. And if you have looked at your DevOps tooling uh, recently, you will probably agree with me, agree with me that, uh, you know, while some claim network um, as being part of their solution, it usually stops at, um, you know, ETH zero, uh, meaning there's a critical gap in understanding network primitives like prefix, path, underlay, overlay, and all that kind of stuff that, you know, we care about as network professionals to plan, build, operate, and scale network infrastructures. And then finally, well, if you follow some of these principles we've discussed today, uh, you can get there and uh, you can get there whether you want to build or uh, buy. And keep in mind that Kente can help in either case. And we're here as a resource wherever you are in your um, observability journey. So with that, let's open it up for uh, some Q&A. We got a few minutes uh, left and I'd be um, very interested in hearing your uh, questions. And Angela, I don't think we have time to do the poll, so. Oh, okay. I want you anyway. Um, so if anybody wants to vote, um, but okay. as far as yeah, so let's just do the poll, and we'll we'll um, go through the first couple questions that we have. Um, so like Christoph said, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q and A box, or you can just throw them in the chat. Um, for now, let's go ahead and start with the first question um, that has come in. It's how do you come up with these automated tests? And I maybe that's a, a Neil question, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, so as we showed a little bit in the demo, essentially when we were building our Synthetics product, um, we talked to a lot of our customers and we said, hey, how can we build something that's going to go beyond what you currently might have seen or you know, things that would be more useful to you? And we constantly heard from our customers the thought that, you know, could I, combining flow data with synthetic data is useful. And we said, you know, how can we go beyond just correlation and uh, make it also sort of ease the burden of setting up these tests as well? And so that's kind of what we do in our autonomous tests is uh, we're able to look at the flow data and then find um, destinations to test towards automatically for you and then refresh those uh, endpoints or those uh, test destinations 
uh, periodically. Okay, great. Thank you, Anil. So um, we've had some responses. So I'll go ahead and end the poll. And I'll share in just a thank moment. Thank you guys for voting. Yes, thank you. So here are the results. Yeah, the needle in the haystack, that's the key thing, right? And, uh, you know, I've I've heard that term a lot around, uh, you know, compute and application infrastructures, but as, you know, our customers have been telling us, it's coming up more and more uh, for networking. And so, uh, you know, how do you find that needle in the haystack or multiple haystacks during a perfect storm? Well, you know, you need the ability to... Um, drill down into these unknown problems. And the only way to do that is to be able to uh, ask any uh, question about your network. And uh, again, you know, the unbounded insights that we've talked about through the data explorer is exactly what you need to do that. So um, I think we're uh, onto something quite uh, quite nice here. Yeah. So we did- Are there any other questions, Angela? We had one more. Um... So you said in rich data, what are some of the data examples and what do they do for me? What else? Yeah, so I can take a stab and then Dan uh, can uh, jump in. So, um, you know, if you just get the five tuple uh, flow, uh, then obviously that data set is not uh, super rich. For example, you know, it doesn't tell you where uh, the network element with IP address 10.0.0.1 uh, actually sits, right? Uh, and so geolocation is um, a good uh, enrichment. But then also there's all kinds of metadata from, you know, the cloud environment that you can uh, pull in. Uh, there's application level uh, data that you can pull in. And all of this will serve to uh, you know, enrich the data that we have and that you can explore through uh, the data explorer as Dan has uh, shown you. And so, um, you know, there's really the sky's the limit around the context and uh, enrichment. Uh, Threat feeds is another good example uh, that is really valuable for our customers for DDoS uh, detection and, and mitigation. Uh, and so hopefully that gives you some idea of what we mean by uh, context and enrichment. I'll just add on to that a little bit. Um, yeah. One of the things that we do is that, that makes us unique is taking BGP data as well. And so, you know, that gives us some insight into how your traffic is going across the internet if you use that protocol. And so we can see some of the, um, you know, the, the problems with the hop, uh, especially if you're using synthetic as well. Um, so if you're, you know, sending traffic three hops away uh, and there's a problem with uh, one of the hops, you know, maybe two hops in, We'll be able to find that immediately um, because you've enriched your flow data with that BGP data. Um, but then we don't uh, limit you. So we've got a matching system that allows you to say um, traffic that specify or that looks like this kind of characteristic, you know, this source IP on this uh, server, um, on this port, uh, coming across this interface, for example, um, is application Y, application X. Um, and, and so you can really, uh, you know, be as creative or as imaginative as you want. And what we've seen is a lot of people uh, will put their business data in. They'll say, oh, okay, this is my application and this is the, uh, the, the, the pod that it sits in inside my data center. This is the team that's responsible for it and so on and so forth. So that when your, your NetOps teams are, are looking for that correlation that Christoph mentioned, it's right there. It's right there in the flow. They, they waste no time trying to find that. Okay, okay cool. Um, so we did have one other question come in. I think we have just a minute for it. So um, the question is, is there heuristics in the solution to help notify about potential performance degradation or outages? Yeah, so I'll take a first step. So uh, the answer is yes, and we have more than just uh, heuristics. We're actually using some you know, pretty advanced uh, statistical methods already today. We um, are you know, very uh, actively working on um, advancing our machine learning uh, agenda as well. Um, so we, you know, we've hired the uh, data scientist uh, personnel to uh, help with that because we believe that insights based on, uh, you know, statistics and eventually machine learning is a, a real key point. So, you know, we do have uh, things like factors, insights, 
which are some sort of uh, heuristics. We have, uh, you know, obviously the traditional baselining stuff uh, that uh, you can call uh, heuristics. And so, yes, we have a bunch of those today, and we're continuously adding adding more. Okay, that's that's all the questions we have. Angela, want to wrap us up? Yeah. All right. Thank you to today's speakers and our audience. If there are additional questions or if you'd like more information, you can find us at kentic.com or email us at info at uh, The recorded version of today's presentation will be available following the event. Please look for an email from the Kentic team to rewatch and share the presentation. Have a nice day, everyone.